Welcome to the Bitcoin Bottom Line. I am joined today by my friend Greg Foss, longtime bond guy, and we're going to geek out about bonds. And we also have a special guest today too, Carpe Noctum. TJ can't join us today, and Carpe is going to be our fact checker. We need fact checks here in Bitcoin. All right, well, let's get started. Greg, how have you been? It's been an interesting time, Stephen, let me tell you. I've never been more busy, and I'm supposed to be retired, so, uh, so that's good. I'm staying relevant. What I love about you is, I mean, you retired a long time ago, but you're so passionate about Bitcoin that you've made a lot of investments in companies, in projects. You've helped out a lot of people out of the kindness of your heart, you know, without making an investment. I mean, that's actually, you know, kind of how I met you was. Exactly. Yeah, we met. Advice. We had a, an investment where we were co-investors and so you helped the company. The company became very successful from the, to the extent that Canada now has Bitcoin ETFs, thanks to that company that started the closed end Bitcoin funds, right? And, you know, it gave uh, the regulators comfort that uh, a spot Bitcoin ETF can work. It won't be manipulated. Yeah, proud to have been part of that project and uh, partner with you in that. So that's, that's how we met. Yeah, absolutely. That was a lot of fun. And, and it kind of gave us, you know, really the thought to, you know, at, at Valkyrie to move into the U.S. and try doing the same Beautiful. thing. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, yeah. congrats on your Bitcoin mining ETF. That's, that's a valuable, a valuable instrument. There is a lot of smart people in the Bitcoin community. And there's actually the Canadians in the Bitcoin community, I think actually punch above their weight a little bit in, from a global perspective. And uh, a lot of them, uh, you know, there's some good mining companies up here and Bitcoin miners specifically. So yeah, nice to see that succeeding. And I love the ticker symbol. So we're going to make it. So let's do it. Yeah, I love it. I think, you know, last time that we were together in person, we, we were talking a lot about some of the mining that was happening in, in Canada. We were kind of geeking out about gas flaring and yeah. how that might be a thing. And sure enough, right after we had those conversations and you brought up, you know, uh, Alberta and what was happening up there. Mm -hmm. that uh, China decided to shut down all of its miners. Miners moved to North America, and guess what they're doing? They're plugging into gas flaring. Yeah. How are you seeing that progress in Canada at the moment? Well, we don't have that much flare gas, to be honest, in Canada. So, uh, you know, the U.S. has more flare. What we have and the company I'm involved with, we actually have 400 megawatts of power that are former peaking plants. They're located right along the Trans-Canada Natural Gas Pipeline. We will be mining Bitcoin at those plants. In fact, HUD-8 is one of our clients in one of our facilities. So what's, what's happening in Canada, though, that you're seeing is the understanding of how Bitcoin can be used in conjunction. Let's say these peaking plants are going to, you know, there's the 5 or 10% of the time that the grid needs excess power, you know, you mine Bitcoin for 90% of the time and the 10% of the time when you're being paid in the capacity market, it's a beautiful business model. Yeah. So we have 400 megawatts here. That'll put us in a pretty nice position to compete with a lot of the biggest Bitcoin miners from a power perspective. You're just seeing the uh, certain accounts in Canada embracing it. When I say certain accounts, I mean, investing accounts, becoming investors in the Bitcoin mining space, even before they actually own the physical, which is strange, but it's sometimes, you know, how accounts do it. Oh, I'm not really allowed to own Bitcoin, but I'll own, own, own a proxy and it's a Bitcoin miner, right? So they get their beta there. Yeah. Well, what was really interesting was when we were launching ETFs and other types of, of products, you know, we were thinking about really two different audiences, the intermediary audience, which is obviously, you know, financial advisors and wirehouse platform right familiar with and then we were thinking about institutions as well and you're right i mean oddly enough i mean nobody wants to own bitcoin directly at all right which this that's the way i recommend owning bitcoin is directly oh yeah yeah but, me too me too but you know if you're not going to own it directly and you need somebody to handle it for you you know you kind of use you, you have to use a, a few different models and when we were looking at how to productize Bitcoin rather than holding Bitcoin directly, which is in, in a product is, is another thing that a lot of these guys don't want to do. As we were investigating, we found that there were, there were two different ways to do it. Number one was, was miners, right? Say, okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll own the miners, but even that is sort of niche 
for a lot of the wirehouses. The ETF that we launched in December is actually way more suitable for those people. And, and that was companies that hold Bitcoin on their balance sheet. They, right, they want the right, correlation right. to Bitcoin, but they don't want the miners. They don't want to hold Bitcoin. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I think I think a lot of these shops are just a little too far off to to, to still get there. You know, there's there's Bitcoin. But it's coming, right? It's removed. coming because, you yeah. know, here's the thing. You saw that Fidelity report. You know, it's a great report uh, for any listeners who haven't read it. Uh, you know, there's it basically is to summarize. There's Bitcoin and then there's, you know, I don't know if you swear on your show, but uh, you'll have to edit this. Uh, there's Bitcoin and then there's shit coins is basically the, the conclusion. But Fidelity thinks that by 2026, the Bitcoin asset class will be a sleeve in every landscape. And when Fidelity says that, everyone's got to be thinking that, oh boy, Fidelity is one of the largest asset managers in the world. And if they offer it, I better turn around and get it in my own uh, product line too, right? So yeah. I think that that's, uh, it's coming. But it's funny, you get a, an account, like, you, you know, the Canadian accounts, big accounts like Ontario Teachers, they'll buy... Uh, uh, an investment in FTX and they'll buy an investment in Celsius network, but God forbid they should actually own physical Bitcoin, right? <laughs> Which exactly. is just like, you know, they're sort of doing it ass backwards, but that's not the first time that that's, that's happened. Uh, yeah. I started my career as a high yield bond trader in Canada. And the funniest thing is when I would call an account and say, Hey, uh, you know, you own $700 million, literally you own $700 million of Rogers communications stock. How about you buy some of their new issue bonds at a 10% coupon and they go, no, I can't own the bonds because they're junk. And I'm like, oh, hold on a second. You own the subordinate claim equity. You own 700 million of it and you won't even buy the bonds, which are a senior claim and pay a 10% coupon. And anyway, you know, you go through that long enough, you end up banging your head against the wall. But, of, you know, 20 years ago, nobody in Canada, well, let's say 30 years ago, nobody in Canada owned high yield bonds. Yeah. And now every asset manager has a high yield bond sleeve. The same thing's going to happen with Bitcoin. Yeah. It'll happen faster, but uh, it's going to happen. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I remember having to deal with that, you know, here in the U.S. Uh, with institutional accounts. I traded some bonds and I was also a portfolio manager for, uh, for fixed income for large institutions. And life insurance is another area that you, you look at and you're like, okay, well, number one, they're not going to hold Bitcoin directly. They can't. Okay, um, but uh, when it comes to to junk bonds, life insurance companies are really governed by the rate, rating agencies for. Oh yeah, you know, and the rating agencies determine how much capital they have to reserve against each one of their investments. So, you know, that's why they're so filled up with uh, investment grade bonds and treasuries, yeah. even though yeah. from a, a real perspective, it's a negative yield at the moment, because junk bonds are really anywhere between an NAIC four to an NAIC six, which is the lowest ratings you can get. And NAIC six has like a 30% capital charge against right, it. Right, right. And from their perspective, it's okay, I can hold a junk bond or I can have the same capital reserve as an equity and my expected return on equity is higher than a junk bond. So I might right. as well buy the equity or even better private equity, right? Uh, they'd yeah. rather own private equity than, than, than a lot of junk bonds. So yeah. It took a long time to get them over some of those issues. And uh, one of the interesting ways we got around a lot of it was by doing, um, you know, st structured product. Structured product, yeah, structured product for sure. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, essentially, you know, wrap up a CLO and then and then, and then, and then sell the higher rated uh, tranche. Uh -huh. uh, it's, still, it's still a junk bond. Yes, sir. It sure <laughs> is. Yes, sir. It, should, it still is. Yeah. Junk bond's a junk bond. Um, or, 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 as, or as we found out during the financial crisis, you know, a, a bad mortgage is still a bad mortgage, even if it's packaged up nicely into a CDO. Wow. Well, don't forget, though, in 2007, the uh, Fed did say that the sub, subprime mortgage crisis was largely contained. So don't, don't worry. Everything was fine in 2007, according to the Fed. Uh, we're walking down a similar path right now. These clowns have no clue what they're doing. So that's... Yeah. Uh, well, it's funny because Josh, Josh and I, we, we, we talk about this a lot, right? You know, what, what is the Fed going to do and what's the Fed thinking, right? And the problem with the Fed is they're very academic. They've never traded risk. And they're always very backward looking. They're waiting for data from, you know, months ago or a year ago to make decisions about things that they can do a month from now that will affect the economy a year to three years from yeah, now. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's not an easy job, but the worst part of it is, uh, I believe, that a true lack of understanding about how the markets work. And uh, you can jawbone all you want, but at the end of the day, when volatility exceeds 30% annualized in the equity market, so the VIX being over 30, that implies daily moves of plus or minus 2% average daily volatility. New issue markets and everything close when vol is over 30%. And vol is creeping up. And if new issue markets close, access to capital closes and growth stops. And you're not going to be able to hike eight times, okay? I'm, you know, you, you can never be 100% certain, but this is just not going to happen. Yet they're job owning the market. They're leaking it out through Goldman Sachs uh, as if Goldman, you know, because it's coming from Goldman. Well, it's going to happen, right? Anyway, it's, it's a difficult situation they're in. I predict that a taper tantrum happens probably after it is little as two rate hikes. Then it's okay. They walk it back. Well, this is funny because I, I was actually hoping that we would have different views on this, but uh, we, we, we don't. Um, okay. I, 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 yeah, I hadn't heard your view, but I can't imagine that, you know, I couldn't imagine that you thought different than that. Anyone who sat in a risk chair knows that, uh, you know, at first it starts in the credit markets and the credit guys use the equity as the, as the whipping boy, then equity markets start falling apart. And given that everybody, there's no returns left in bonds. So everybody's pension is now relying almost entirely on equities as the, as a performance generator. Uh, if pension funds go to the underfunded status, uh, there's going to be a lot of upset pensioners out there. There'll be an upset president and there'll be pressure to, uh, to, to skate the equity markets back on sides. So like, I just, we'll, we'll have to see how this goes, but, uh, I'm, I'm just like sold to you. You think eight, I think two, you know, and, and let's figure out where it really is going to be. Yeah. I mean, I, I was saying back in, I don't know, between, between November and January, you know, for, for about that period, I was saying that we would have one rate hike. And a boy, interesting. One, exactly yeah. one. Okay. Because, because once that, once that first rate hike hits, hits and people say, oh, they're actually for real right now. Yeah. Then, well, know, so then Stephen, we, that's crazy cool because in January, it was the first month in the history of the NASDAQ that the long bond and the NASDAQ were both down more than 2% in the month. The NASDAQ was down 15 something, if I remember correctly, in January, and the long bond was down eight points or 8% in the month of January. That's uh, used to be able to rely on the long bonds as your dampening, right? When equities went down, bond prices went up and uh, the two Ray Dalio built his entire business on in the uh, risk parity. Well, it doesn't work when interest rates are 1% or lower, okay? There is no cushion in bonds. They don't, you know, in, in rational places, they don't trade through zero. Irrational places like Europe, they do, but that's okay. Yeah. There is no protection in bonds right now. And so the, the long bond is now off 20 points from its high. That's $20. I need people to understand what 20 bond points are. That's $20 or 20%. And if the coupon was 2%, You've lost 10 years of return in one month of bond price changes, okay? That's not that safe. And X, oh, don't worry. I own bonds. They're safe. Oh, yeah, good on you. You failed mathematics, you knucklehead. Right. Well, but if I just hold on to them till it matures, then uh, I'm okay, it's, called an right? it's called an opportunity cost. And you don't, you know, you, you just, right. you, you can tell your clients, well, I'm uh, going to be fine. I'll be paid out in 28 years. They're going to look at you and say, uh-uh, you're not holding my money for 28 years. Give me my money back now. Yeah. And uh, that's the reality. So life insurance portfolios, they'd have matched assets and liabilities. That's fine. But for a regular mutual fund, for a regular uh, investor. I mean, pensions, same thing, right? I mean, they run off of LDI. So yeah, there's a little bit of a buy and hold, but at the same time, they need that return every year. Oh, they have 100% because... Look what you need right now in the, in the 60, 40 portfolio, let's just say your 40%, which is your bonds. Is it fair to say an average return on the, or an average coupon on all the bonds, whether they're treasuries, munis, junk bonds, 
is a 3% uh, 3% yield, okay? 3% times 40% is 1.2% is what you're getting on the 40% of your portfolio. You're earning 1.2% there, excluding defaults. Now, if you have a hurdle rate like CalPERS, of which is 7.5%, that means you need on your 60% equity portfolio to earn the difference between 7.5% and 1.2%. So that's, what is that, 6.3%. 6.3% out of a 60% equity portfolio means the equities have to go up 10% annually forever in order for you to make a blended return of your 7.5% hurdle right. before defaults. Ain't going to happen, people. So what did CalPERS do? Oh, we're going to fix this. We're going to use leverage. Right. What could possibly go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? What nothing a bunch of clowns. No, nothing, nothing. Yeah. Leverage is, leverage is yeah. perfectly safe. Use, Holy use moly. Right. Holy moly. And yet they won't buy Bitcoin because, uh, you know, that's risky. Well, the other so thing at, doing Looking at in, NASDAQ. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Say that again, Josh. No, I was just going to say, looking at NASDAQ against Bitcoin, Bitcoin's actually down. Uh, the decline is smaller than NASDAQ. Uh, since year to date and bonds. So are this is negative. where I think things, this is where I think things eventually go to Josh. And, and, you know, we talked about this Bitcoin will be a long volatility asset. When people finally do their homework, they'll understand that Bitcoin is insurance. It is effectively being short credit. And when you are short credit, you are long volatility. And you love being long volatility because how does volatility trade, right, Stephen? You know, you take the staircase down, you take the staircase down. So, you know, it bounces around at 14% annualized and then the world unravels, boom, takes the elevator up, hits 80%. You want to be long vol when things go from 14% to 80%. Trust me. Yeah. And that's why Bitcoin is so beautiful. But it takes an education process because right now all the machines, the computers, programmed by humans are trading Bitcoin against equities and trying to correlate those two things. And it's working to an extent, but over time, they're going to be so inverted, there'll be a face ripping rally for all these knuckleheads that are short Bitcoin against long equities. It's right. just ridiculous. Well, and this is something we've talked about, right? Um, you know, I've, I've always, the, the way that I've always, you know, I hold some Bitcoin and I trade some Bitcoin. And the way that I trade Bitcoin and other markets is I looked for the short-term correlations. correlations. You know, back in 2017, it was the Kospi. If you were if you were yeah. watching closely in 2018, it was uh, Shanghai Index. You could literally, just watch the Shanghai Index overnight and trade Bitcoin the next day. Interesting. So Interesting. It, was, it was it was and 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 it's been a lot more correlated in this last year to to equities, mostly mm -hmm. to the Nasdaq, but. Here's where I think it's going to go. I think that we're we're going to start trading a little bit more closely to uh, commodities. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I think we're going to have a rally in commodities. Anything that is a is a uh, a rare asset. There's there's not enough commodities to go around right now. There's there's supply chain issues. You've got these these truckers in Canada that are trying to shut everything down. Shame on them. <laughs> You've got, um, you know, but, but, but you don't have enough, you don't have enough things coming out of the ground. Right. Things shipping to, to places. And, and that's, what's calling. Was it a wall street journal yeah. article or the title? I, I remember the title. I can't remember where I read it, but the title basically said, you name it, we're out of it. And that's it was right. a commodity guy. Like, and he said, you need it. You need steel. You need nickel. You need platinum. You need this. We don't have it. <laughs> okay, so like it's it's basically uh, that's the reality. Sure, lumber, coffee, wheat, okay. cotton, yeah. all of it, right? Yeah, I, I, I take oil and gold out of that, out of those okay. categories because we can, we can, we can, we can control oil, you know, whether yes, it's sir. Or, yeah, uh, or OPEC, but um, but I don't think there's gonna be enough Bitcoin. I don't think I know. I know there's enough. not going to be enough Bitcoin. Okay. I mean, it's that's the simple math of it. There is not going to be enough Bitcoin and it's going to become game theory, right? Because everyone in the world is at the mercy of the Fed and they have the everybody, all other central bankers included, have what they call the Fed put, you know, the Fed will rescue the world. Right. And it was a, it was a, uh, a term that was coined when Alan Greenspan came in and Rumor was when equity markets were down by 20%, the Fed would come in and rescue equity markets. So the Fed put, my interesting thing is what happens if the Fed put doesn't work? 
Because there will be a time when the Fed tries to rescue the markets and the markets are like, no, sir, we've seen how this ends. We've seen it every single time. So the other central banks in the world are going to have to be like, what if the Fed put doesn't work? What can we own? And my argument is you own Bitcoin. Right. And then you start a games race or an arms race. One central bank buys some Bitcoin. And then other central banks are like, what the heck's going on here? I better get some too, right? And so it's a put on the Fed put. Bitcoin is a put on the Fed put. And that makes me pretty excited because then you can explain why Bitcoin is the best asymmetric return opportunity I've ever seen in 30 years of managing risk. And yep. you weight it accordingly. Yeah. Well, going back to the Fed, let's talk about that for a moment because okay. I think I think what's going to happen is going to be really interesting. I shared that I thought there would be one rate hike, and and that was my opinion up through through January. I think we're subject to, you know, depending on what happens in markets and, and policies, we're allowed to change, and that's what we're supposed to do. Yes, sir. Um, but but I thought that you know we would we would end tapering in March. There'd be an announcement in March. There would be a rate hike in May because the Fed likes markets to be prepared. Uh, they like all the risks to be priced in before yeah. they do anything. Right. I mean, that's that's how they work. They don't want disruptions, especially in a midterm election year. Right. And and then and then there would be one rate hike and then people would actually think that the, the Fed was for real and then they would stop. Well, as, as you said it, uh, they, they've leaked information through a lot of sources and and, and you've got, oh, there's going to be seven rate hikes. There's going to be a <laughs> hundred basis point hike all at once. There's going to be a 50 <laughs> basis point hike all at once in March. And they're letting the markets price that in. I think they're going to try to do something in March. I agree. Uh, but I think that there'll be two, maybe three. So I'm, I'm probably more closer with, with, with you now, uh, now that a lot of this is being priced in. And, and then after two or three, the market's not going to be able to take it. I mean, well, they won't trade junk bonds. Yeah. Yeah. So right? what happens, right? Like, I mean, what happens here? I'll, uh, this is what happens and why credit spreads are blowing out right now. Credit spreads are blowing out because, first of all, there's been a sell-off in the equity markets. Therefore, the cushion, the equity cushion that is subordinate to the, to the credit, that equity cushion has been reduced by 10%. So therefore, spreads need to widen a bit to account for the lower equity cushion. But if the yield curve inverts, it has successfully caused uh, called six of the last six recessions, okay? An inverted yield curve will imply recession. And you don't want to own credit going into a recession. So credit spreads are going to have to widen more. And when credit spreads widen more, the cascade hits downwards and smacks the equity guys. And they don't understand what's going on. They get run over because they're just equity gooks. Okay. And at the end of the day, the credit markets control everything. And that's where the Fed will have to stop because Yield spreads or credit spreads are going to be widening. Equity markets are going to be getting destroyed. And if the Fed is hiking into a recession, that's, well, that's disaster, okay? Right. And uh, credit sniffs that out, prices the de increased default expectations accordingly, and then everything goes to heck in a handbasket. And uh, yeah, they will stop. Right. The Fed well, will stop. Well, let's talk about what's, precisely happening with the companies that are issuing junk bonds right yeah i keep calling them junk bonds you know uh but um that's you know, all good junk us, bonds us the super junk equity no 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 <laughs> if you call them a junk bond which is a pejorative make sure you call the same the equity of the same company super junk equity right exactly. and we have five minutes left but yeah they're junk bonds well, we might have to go we might have to go longer but but what i want to talk about here is you know most of the people that are watching or listening they, they don't know that junk bonds are usually priced to five-year, right? Correct. And five-year treasuries are almost 2%. And that's, that's right. The They're very that flat between fives and tens, right? Fives and tens are almost exactly the same yield. There's maybe 10 basis points spread in, the, in that curve. And the five years jump to 2% because there's an expectation now, it's being priced in, that we're going to have, you know, seven or eight hikes, whatever it is, six or seven. Right, or right. And that's not pre that's not entirely priced in, but but the it's not, it's not, but it's 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 getting there. Yeah. So if you have the five year at two, right? And the way that the way that junk bonds work or, or the companies that issue 
high yield bonds work is they typically issue, you know, shorter paper than, than, than investor grade companies. It's usually anywhere between two and five year paper, yeah. uh, sometimes seven if they're lucky. And they never, they never just mature because they can't afford to pay the principal. They always roll it. That always rolls. They always roll it a year, a year yeah. in advance, right? Yeah. A year in advance of maturity yeah. or, or, or callability. Yeah. And right now at the five years at 2%, a lot of these companies can't pay their debt service there on that go. new on that new rate. So there you go. And you have to widen yield spreads or widen credit right. spreads to accommodate or reward the investor for the increased default probability. Higher interest rates mean higher interest service or debt service costs mean lower credit quality, mean wider yield spreads, everything else being equal. And when yield spreads widen, that's when the Fed needs to get concerned. And right. remember in the last in the COVID crisis, when the Fed bought junk bonds, they were buying it because of four different credits that cumulatively, these four credits have more debt than the entire high yield bond market. And these were right on the cusp of being downgraded. Those four credits are AT&T, General Motors, Ford, and General Electric, all triple B companies that are right on the cusp of being downgraded. If they got downgraded, the high yield market would have been inundated was supply and everything would have stopped. So right. the Fed said, we'll be able to buy junk bonds or high yield bonds. Well, get ready, Fed. You're going to have to do the same thing again. What does that mean? They get snuffed out. They're, they're, yeah. There's no, there's not eight interest rate hikes coming. Well, and it creates a death spiral. It right? is. That's all it, it is. You know, you know, because, because the risk-free rate goes higher. Yeah. Spreads blow out. Yeah. Then they have to go higher. Then spreads blow out even more. I mean, it's just it, it'll just keep going until you have you know defaults of twelve to fifteen percent, which they're not going to let that happen. They cannot because well, first of all, high yield is still low yield because it yields about five percent. And if you had fifteen percent defaults at an average recovery rate of forty cents on the dollar, that means fifteen uh, percent. That means you're losing nine percent, right? That's sixty percent loss on fifteen percent. And the market's yielding 5% and defaults are going to cost you 9%. Mm -hmm. High yield bonds are the worst investment I've seen in my 30 years of managing risk. And yeah. all bonds are horrible, except volcano bonds. We'll, we'll, we could go there right. some other day. But uh, historically, high yield bonds have always been the best investment. They have when they were actually high yield. Because when right. I started, they were double digit yields. They were 14% yields in high yield because that was high yield. Right. And by the way, Inflation wasn't running at seven and a half percent. So there's just no reason to own bonds unless you failed mathematics. So basically learn math, sell your bonds, buy Bitcoin. I'll see you in Miami. Awesome. And looking at one last thing, we're looking at rates and uh, CPI globally. The U.S. has the highest real central bank rate, uh, aside from Turkey and Argentina, who are at 35 and 11% respectively. Yeah, those uh, two are defaulted, right? So Argentina has defaulted four times in my career. There's never been a 30-year bond that's matured in my lifetime because Argentina has actually defaulted four times. So whoever buys a 30-year Argentinian bond, uh, you know, you better start studying history because you certainly failed math. And the, the worst part of it is Argentina is a G20 country. So, you know, it's going to happen. And I'm in Canada. I'm a proud Canadian. Canada will default 10 years before the USA defaults and we're G7, okay? Be careful, own Bitcoin. Hey, thanks for joining the Bitcoin Battle Line. It's been, a, it's been a blast. I look forward to meeting CJ and uh, nice meeting you guys and great work, uh, Valkyrie. Uh, proud of you guys. Hey, thanks so much, Greg. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do this again with CJ uh, here, here in a couple of months. I look forward to it. Okay, thanks for having me, guys. Thank you. Take care.